When I was in junior high, I got to be a part of something special. Uh, during my three years there at Calis Junior High up in Puyallup, Washington, uh, all three years, I was part of a wrestling team uh, that just really was something different than anything I've experienced before. Uh, I was on a team that was, I had amazing teammates, uh, but it was really interesting because it was a monstrous team, just a huge team that I've never heard of anywhere else. We, in my three years, uh, were, had between 95 and 115 wrestlers on a single team. And so we were this massive team, but not only were we were massive, we were incredibly successful. In my three years there, uh, we took first place two years and second place the, the other year. And outside of that, during the entire time, we lost one match, a one match to a, a tough team, and it came down to the final wrestling individual match and it ended in controversy. Otherwise, I, we didn't experience loss. Uh, all we did was win. And we would just, to be clear, we would steamroll teams. We would come in and beat teams like 90 to 3, which if you've been a part of wrestling, is just, it doesn't really happen. And so uh, we would go about to different teams and we wouldn't be questioning, oh, are we going to win today? We were like, how much are we going to win by? How many pins are we going to get? We expected to win and we did win. And it was my ninth grade year being a part of this team and I was jacked. I was so excited because my ninth grade year was going to be my year. It was going to be the year that I would get my glory, right? You know, I was the upperclassman, I guess, if that's a thing, in junior high because I was ninth grade, but that's the oldest of the three grades. And I was going to be successful. I was wrestling at the time, I believe it's 104 weight class, and I was uh, expected to, to, to just blast through every opponent. I was expected to win every match. I was expected to win conference. I was expected to take first place. And to be clear, I wasn't like a great wrestler. I was kind of decent, above average, but the weight class I was in, it just so happened that I was far and away better than almost everybody out there. And so I was looking forward to finally having a good year. My two previous years, I had an injury on my knee. I had mono. I didn't get to finish either season, but this season was going to be mine. I was going to get the glory. My team was going to get the glory. Things were going to be perfect, but there was a problem. There was a problem we had on the team. Uh, in our lightweight, our, our lower weight uh, areas, we had an unequal distribution of talent. In my weight class, we had three guys, myself at varsity, the two Ryans behind me at JV and Exhibition. We were some of our more talented wrestlers, particularly in the, the lighter weights, but we were all stuck in the one weight class, which meant our other weight classes around, and in particular, the lower weight class had a huge problem. And on, Interestingly enough, on a team with like 110 guys that year, the weight class below us, 98 pounds, it had one guy, and it just so happens that that one guy in the, alone in the weight class was probably our worst wrestler on the entire team. So we had a log jam of strong wrestlers, uh, a couple places with weak wrestlers, and my coach had a problem. How does he distribute this talent in a way that would allow our team to win, our, our team to achieve a three-peat? And so what he did is he came up with the plan. He came to me and my dad and, and, and presented this idea. He said that he would ask me if I would consider moving down a weight class for the entirety of the year to cover that hole on our team and give us a chance to win another championship. And after discussing it with my parents and weighing all the pros and cons, is this healthy for me at this age? We decided that for two and a half months, I would cut weight, which was equivalent to like three pounds. I would cut these three pounds so that I could help my team. And, and, and I did it really begrudgingly. I did it, yes, I was excited to help, but it would come at my cost. I would no longer be expected to win every match. I would no longer be expected to win first. The expectation and the reality was I was going to finish like somewhere between fifth and second place. I had no chance at getting first. The guy there from a different school, he wasn't just the best wrestler in the weight class. He might have been the best wrestler in the entire area, pound for pound. I was going to lose out on what I wanted most, my own personal glory. And yet I went through with this plan and it was miserable. I was hungry. I was tired. I lost matches simply because I got out on the mat and I had nothing to give. I would lose because I couldn't even fight back. I was so, so lacking in energy. 
And yet what happens at the end of the year is I am able to figure it out and I take third and I give my team a chance to win the championship. And unfortunately we fall just short. We take second place. But in submitting to that authority, something more important had to happen. By submitting to the authority of my coach, I gained more than simply winning. I learned things and grew in ways that benefited me my whole life. Right? I learned perseverance and endurance and sacrifice, and I gave my team a chance to win. By submitting, I bettered myself and I bettered my team. And so today, we're looking at that idea. Obedience and submission, how it benefits ourselves, how it benefits those around us. And we're going to take a look at what Peter and really what God has to say about submitting to authority. And so we're continuing our series, First Peter. And today, we're, this theme that has been running through obedience is going to continue to be present. And we're going to actually dive into some difficult topics for the next three weeks, including today. Uh, and we're going to take a break for Easter, but these next three weeks for that we look at First Peter, we're going to be looking through some topics that are particularly difficult. Difficult because one, they're just hard, but also because they are culturally and politically uh, charged topics. We are going to be looking at obedience. We're going to be looking at obedience to the government, obedience to, uh, from slaves to their masters, and obedience in relation between men and women. And so today we're going to start looking into that. And through this whole series, I've heard, man, this is, this is difficult. This is challenging. This call to obedience and holiness is difficult. Uh, and I've heard this has been a kick in the pants uh, for some people. And I, I guess i got to say, it's, it's really just begun. He's going to call us to something that I think for a lot of us, we don't really like. So let's, let's just get into it. He's going to start off. This uh, middle of chapter 2, verse 11, he says, Beloved, I urge you as sojourners and exiles to abstain from the passions of the flesh which wage war against your soul. And he's going to start off this really second part of his letter, and he's going to go right back to starting it in a very particular way. He's going back to, uh, he's going back to identity. Because he's going to challenge us to something good, but he's going to remind us in how he writes that this all stems out of not your own power, but the identity that you have in Christ, the power that he gives you. Right? He left off last week talking about our identity as a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, people who were not of God, but are now of God. And he continues this line of identity because it requires, uh, obedience requires us to live out of this identity. And so he says, beloved. He chooses his words carefully. It's not this Adelphos. It's not this, hey, brothers and sisters, uh, this is what we're called to. No, he, he looks at who God calls us. We are his beloved. We are a people of his own possession that he loves. He loves so much that it, 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 it drives him to sacrifice himself on a cross so that we can be in relationship with him. That is where our obedience stems out of, not of our own power, but that he loves us so much and it should drive us forward. And he uses some other identity words, sojourners and exiles. And so a reminder, he's writing to a people, followers of Christ, who are literal sojourners and exiles. They have been forced out of their homes. They have chased, been chased to the point of death. They're living in a land that is not their own. So yes, he's saying you literal sojourners and exiles, but he's writing to something deeper that applies to us. He's getting at this idea that they and us, we are first and foremost citizens of heaven. That no matter where we are, whether we're in northern Turkey, whether we are in America, we may be and we are, in fact, citizens of America. But deeper than that, we are citizens of heaven. And our conduct should be befitting of a citizen of heaven. We should act not as Americans first, but as, uh, the, as followers of Christ. That is our identity and I, and I know these words, sojourners and exiles, are not really common words that we use. So I went and looked at some of the different translation. What words do they use? And, and what I found was it was foreigners, temporary residents, pilgrims, aliens, strangers. 
That is what we are at all times. No matter where we are, this is how we should live. Not as citizens of a nation, but citizens of heaven. And it got me thinking, um, what does that look like? What does it mean to live like this at all times? And I, all I could think of was we have a missions team uh, that is going down to Mexico very soon. They are going down to Mexico to go to a foreign land, a land that is not their own, to proclaim the glories of the gospel, to, to win the lost back to Christ. And it's not the words he used, but I can't help but think we should have the mindset that we are missionaries, whether we are at home or afar, that we are missionaries because our home isn't here. We have an eternal home in heaven. And wherever we are, we should live as though we are missionaries. And so Peter, he's going to write on, he's going to take a look at, again, why are we obedience? What is the purpose of obedience? We're not obedient for obedience's sake. I think that's something a lot of us struggle at. I look at my kids, right? They ask that question uh, when I give them a command, why do I have to do it? And of course, in my human failing, sometimes I say, because I said so. And it's not just because he said so. There's something more that he has for us. And so he's gonna, Peter's gonna look at it from two perspectives that obedience we practice obedience for our good. Obedience is for our good, not just collectively, but also individually. It is for each and every one of our good. And I think that's a really hard thing to swallow. We don't like the idea of obedience. Obedience is holding something from us instead of this idea from God. Obedience is driving us to what is good. He said, Beloved, I urge you as sojourners and exiles to abstain from the passions of the flesh, which wage war, against your soul. He's talking about obedience. And in this case, he's talking about a specific kind of obedience that is abstaining from things of this world, abstaining from the passions of our flesh because they keep us from what God has for us. That too often we live in the passions of the flesh because they are uh, appealing to us. Because we think we can get something that we can't find in God that actually is the only thing or the only person we can get it from. We think that God is holding out on us so we pursue the passions of our flesh, our disordered desires in a, in a world that says thing, everything is okay and everything is permitted, everything is good. Instead of being obedient to what God has prepared for us, he created us with the specific way we are to live, and it's for our best. It is for our good. And too often we look outside of that for, uh, in search of something, and it only leads to our destruction. I look at this, abstain from the passions of the flesh. And I can't help but look back uh, to this period of time somewhere in the midst of being like 20 to 23. I'm not good with timelines, but there was in that time this about year and a half period where this is what I was living out. I didn't abstain from the passions of the flesh. I was, I was delighting in the passions of the flesh. When I look back at these five years, and, and, and if I had to describe it in five words, what, what encapsulated my life it was working, uh, working, drinking, pornography, video games, and cussing. Like those were the defining things in my life. Working, drinking, porn, video games, and cussing. And so I, I had no problem with working. It wasn't a, a sin in my life. I was working at a healthy rate. Uh, I was doing, I was working diligently. I was respectful. But every other major aspect of my life, I was doing something that was hurting me and hurting my soul. I was destroying myself. I, and to be clear, I believed in God. I, was, I know for a fact that I was going to heaven, but in the moment, I was chasing things that were not of him because I was seeking something. And I was seeking really a hope that I had lost. I was pursuing these things in an attempt to numb, attempt to to, uh, to, to find uh, desire, an attempt for uh, fake uh, intimacy. I was attempting to do something 
to deal with the difficulties in my life. I was angry. I was lonely. I was depressed. I, I saw no future for myself. I was looking back at the things in my past, the ways I had had potential but didn't ever live up to the potential. And I was seeking a way to fix those things in the things of this world. And each and every one of them, they didn't help. They just led me deeper into those. And through it all, what I needed and what I had taken my eyes off was the hope that is only offered through the gospel that is only offered for Jesus Christ. I was searching for hope in something that, uh, not just something, some things that could never give them to me. That is what the passions of the flesh do. They replace the hope of the gospel with the temporary of today and they never get you what you desperately need. And I was buying into this idea that I think a lot of us buy into that it doesn't matter because it doesn't hurt anybody else. My drinking, my porn, my, my video games, my, <clears throat> my cussing, uh, I was very careful about those. I didn't do them in front of other people. I didn't do them in anyone who would be offensive. I wasn't violent. I just, I did them and I lived this lie that because no one else is hurt by them, it doesn't really matter. My obedience wasn't important because my obedience didn't affect anybody else. And my obedience was destroying me. I was crying out for help and I was turning to the same thing that was desperately, that was, that was, that was, that led to my destruction. And it was bleeding out into all aspects of my life. And what I had to do was I had to turn back to the truth. It was the spirit of God. I know it was the spirit of God inside of me that convicted me, that said, you are leading yourself down to a path that will destroy you. You have to turn back. You have to turn back to the hope that is only found in Christ. You have to turn back to the spirit that lives within you. You have to turn away from these things and turn back to God. And it was through him that I had healing. And I want to I just take a pause here that I, I, I kind of just skimmed over. I, I can't go in depth, but this idea of pornography is prevalent in our society. And unfortunately, it's prevalent in our church. It's this, this, this idea that it's okay because it doesn't hurt anybody. It's just fantasy and it's, it's crushing us. It's crushing us in particular. It's crushing our men. We are not living up to what God is calling us often because of this addiction. And what we do is we hide it. We, we say it's shameful. It will cause issues in our marriage. And so we, we continue to hide it. And we can't hide it. We have to address it. The only way we can experience freedom from it is to bring the darkness to the light. And we've been advertising this idea, uh, this, this class, Sexual Integrity 101. And there are men, there are, you are sitting here today dealing with an addiction, hiding it, thinking that somehow that's going to cure it. And you need to bring it out. You need to address it. And that one of the ways we can help you with that is through this class. And I know you're thinking, man, it's going to hurt my marriage. It's going to hurt my wife. And this class is designed, women, if that's what's going to happen for you, this class is for you as well. We have to address this problem. We have to address a problem that is statistically affecting 70% of the men in our church. We cannot hide it. We have to defeat it. We cannot defeat it on our own. It can only be defeated through turning to the hope that is provided in the gospel. And he talks about this second idea. It's waging a war against your soul. And I think it's another lie we've bought into that once we are saved, we are extracted from the war. That because he has saved us from the penalty of sin and he will save us from the presence of sin, everything good, we're out of the war. We don't have to worry. And the truth is you are always in a war. There is a war waging on around you for your soul. And too often what we are doing is believing that it's not true. We, don't, we, we, we live as though there is no war, that we're not a part of it. And so I want to ask you, are you engaged in the war for your soul? War has come to your front door and too many of us were sitting on the couch asleep or, or we're, we're fighting back with a, a water pistol. Satan cannot take your soul. You have eternal security, but for the present time, he wants you to believe that there's nothing you can do. 
And part of the gospel is that you are being saved from the power of sin in your life. And Satan wants to steal that from you. He wants to steal from you what God has for you. He wants to steal that you can live in the fullness of God, that he desires for you something not just in the future, but something great for you today when we turn to him. So are you engaged in this war for your soul? The second part he's going to talk is, he's going to look at his obedience for the good of others. It's not just this internal thing that obedience helps. It's also this external. He goes on to say, keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable so that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day of visitation. Our obedience is our mission. Often our obedience is, is our witness to a lost people. It's not just the things we say about Jesus, but it's how we live like Jesus, who was obedient to the point of death. One of the most powerful things that appeals to people, yes, is his miracles, yes, that he's God, but that he was obedient to the cross. He was willing to lay down his life. He was willing to submit to a government authority that he actually had power over, that he could have at any point removed himself from the situation, removed people. He created it and he could take it away. And yet he submitted to authority to death. And it appeals to people because it is unnatural to a sinful nature. He says in there that so that when they speak against you as evildoers, I think there's something again we need to acknowledge that he says when they speak against you, this is a promise. If you are following Christ, people will speak evil against you. The world will turn against you. It's what Jesus promised. It's what he's repeating here. We need to not act surprised that the world is turning against us. The world is Satan's, is under Satan's dominion. If you're not following Jesus, you're following him, and which means you're following the darkness. And the darkness hates the light. And when we have the light of God living within us and it comes and it exposes that darkness, their natural reaction is to push against us, to hate us, to speak evil against us. This should not be a surprise for us. And I think we're often acting out of surprise. Oh, they're speaking evil against us. We're not prepared for this and respond with evil. This is what will happen. It has always happened. It is always happening. It will always happen until Jesus brings about the end times. This is our reality. We need to be prepared for it. And he says in that we are to keep our conduct amongst the Gentiles, the non-believers honorable for a purpose they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day of visitation. That in us acting honorable, in us submitting, in us, to obey, in us obeying, they will see that. They will see the wickedness of their ways. They will see the goodness of God and they will in the end glorify him. And he uses this, this idea on the day of visitation and there's a lot of disagreement. What does that mean? Is it when uh, we die and, and we go to, excuse me, we go to Jesus. Is this one at the end when Jesus comes back on earth? And really, uh, there's tr one of those is obviously true, but in the end, what it says is through your obedience, people will come to know Christ and ultimately they will glorify him. How we act matters. Our obedience is our witness. And when we are dishonorable, we hurt our witness, we damage our witness, and we hurt our mission. We are to be an honorable people. How we live matters. And now he's going to go into some different ways. He's going to go into some different ways in how we live amongst the, an evil world and live in obedience, how we live honorable. Right? And today he's going to look at how we submit to authority. And to be clear, he's talking, when he's saying authority, he's going to talk about some different ones. But the first one he's going to talk to, uh, specifically, how do we submit to governmental authority? And I'm just going to be really honest with you. This is not a passage I want. This is a passage I struggle with. This is a passage that I know brings up a lot of anger amongst people. This is a passage that as an American, like I really, 
I really pushed back against because at my core, what I had desired and what I had been taught since I was a child is freedom <clears throat> against all things that I only submit to the government as long as they're doing something for me or I agree with them. And if not, I'm supposed to rebel. I mean, we have it in the idea of how we were formed. We have it in this idea of the Second Amendment. We've been stockpiling things so that when they get too uppity with us, we can uh, put them back down. And what, what Peter, and again, what God's word said is, you are submit to authority. So let's dive into it. He says, be subject for the Lord's sake to every human institution, whether it be to the emperor supreme or to governors as sent by him to punish those who do evil and to praise those who do good. Peter's very clear that every human institution, including government, is something that we are to be subject to. And it's not simply that we're subject to them because they exist. We're subject to them, he says, for the Lord's sake. This is what he desires for us. This is what he wants out of us. It's not because we are to like it or to agree with it. This is what he calls us to do in the midst of all, everything. I want you to look back. He says, whether it be to the emperor as supreme, he's specifically highlighting. Remember, he is, they are living under Nero, an emperor who has decided to place the blame of his evil actions upon followers of Christ and has said, we're to go hunt them down and kill them and feed them to the dogs. And Peter is saying, "Don't not to rebel, but you are to be subject to the emperor. And part of this is that, that government is ultimately an institution that God, in, it's an instrument of God. Government was intended to be a way to carry out God's justice on earth, that he would, through it, punish those who do evil and praise those who good, do good. And since the fall, we've taken it and we twisted it and perverted it and used it for evil. And yet God says, my intent is for government to be used for my righteousness and for my justice. He goes on to say, for this is the will of God, that by doing good, you should put to silence the ignorance of foolish people, live as people who are free, not using your freedom as a cover-up for evil, but living as servants of God. That when we submit to the government, we are living in obedience, not just to the government, but we are living in obedience to God for a purpose. That we are silencing the people who are using the government against us. We are silencing, they are silencing the, the Nero, they are silencing the people who are putting them to death. And, and I think it's a callback to the, remember that these are an ignorant and foolish people. I think I, we often want to rail against them as we view these people in these positions of authority as evil, as the enemy, and they're not the enemy. Satan is the enemy. There are people living under Satan, not because uh, they, they even acknowledge him, but because they are ignorant and foolish people. They don't know the truth, and so they live out a lie. And our submission to the government says something to these people. It says we are different that, that if we fight back how they have, have used the government against us, we look just like them. They don't need to see a reflection of themselves. That's not going to point them to God. The only thing that's going to point them to God is, is us living like him amongst them. And it's through that that we have victory, not through rebelling against them, not through uh, dishonoring them, but through submission and, and, and living honorably under that authority. He talks about this idea that we are free, not using our freedom to cover evil, but living as servants of him. And Jason next week, he's actually going to come back to this verse. It has, uh, it works for both, both sides of it, my side and government authority, when he's going to go ahead and talk about slaves and masters. And he's going to expound upon this. But I want to, I want to point out something that the idea of freedom that we have as Americans doesn't match up with the freedom that God talks about. Our freedom is this idea that I can do what I want whenever I want, as long as it doesn't come in conflict with your freedom. It's un unrestrained freedom. And that's not a biblical model. 
freedom uh, in the Bible is about living obedient to God. This idea of freedom that we have doesn't exist. In the, according to God, there is you will always be a slave to something. You are either a slave to sin or you are a slave to God. And it is only through being a slave to God that we have true freedom. And he ends this passage. He says, honor everyone, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the emperor. And he writes this really, he uses this really cool formatting in here, right? He sandwiches uh, two things between this honor and he does it purposely to compare and contrast this idea of how we're to live uh, in relation to other people. He says, honor everyone. I can't help but think back to Jesus talking about who's your neighbor in the good parable, the good Samaritan. He's like, well, everybody's your neighbor, even the people you hate. Honor everyone. And this word is kind of difficult. So we wanted to give a definition to it, this idea of honor, that honor is simply ascribing value to. So value everyone. Love the brotherhood. That, and he uses the word agape here, this self-sacrificial laying down your life for the brotherhood, these brothers and sisters in Christ that love, then you are to, to, to go to the point of death for one another to build each other up, but also to be a witness to the outside world so that they can join and they can experience the love that only God can provide. And then he goes, fear God. And I have to just think, being in their position, fear God. In the midst of an emperor who is hunting them down and killing, he says, don't fear Nero, fear God. The one who is ultimately in control of everything, have reverence and awe only for him. And he ends, though, again, honor the emperor. Ascribe value to the emperor. Honor the person who is persecuting you. And I, it's, it's, I love it because he says, honor everyone. And then he touches on, yeah, okay, the people that we should love and honor and fear. And then he comes back to him and says, I said everyone. This means Nero. This means the man that you, by all rights should hate and fear and, and want to see eliminated. Honor him, love him. And it's really hard to do that a lot of time. And we can honor him out of the fact that Nero and everyone who opposes us, they are image bearers of God and they are lost image bearers of God. They don't need our wrath and destruction. They need to be pointed back to Jesus. They need to know the truth. Just like you were lost in your ways, they are the same. And while you needed Jesus, so do they. Nero needed the gospel. And I just, I have to just kind of sit on this because it's really highly applicable to us today. You can easy, and I don't like to do this a lot of times because it can cause problems, but we can simply take out honor the emperor and substitute honor the president. I think for a lot of people listening today, that, that made you squirm a bit. Because a lot of us, we don't want to honor the president. We don't like him. We don't agree with him. And yet what God calls us to do is to honor everyone, to ascribe value to the president. And I have to see, say, in the church today, I see a lack of honor for people, but in particular, our government leaders. We dishonor them. I see it not just in the church across America. I see it uh, pretty prevalent in our county. Often I see people who I say they follow Christ and they're flying flags in, uh, down the road. They're flying flags in front of schools that have cuss words in relation to our president. They're doing a lot of things, but honoring him is certainly not what they're doing. And I get it. It's hard. I don't want to honor him. I, I'll just be frank with you. I have lived under five presidents. And according to my values, I haven't seen one that is worthy of honor. And yet what God calls to is despite my feelings and my, uh, about this person and what they have done and what they stand for, I am and we are to honor them. We are to honor them despite who they are and what they do. And I want to make sure I'm understanding. Honoring doesn't mean that you can't disagree with, that you can't vote against, that you can't maybe challenge in court, that you can't have debates with or are, are pushed to be better. 
but we're not to devalue them. We're not to dehumanize them. We're not to make them the enemy. When we look at obedience, obedience is an instrument of God to redeem the lost. It's an instrument of God to grow us and it's for the benefit of others. When I look back at my story about me in high, junior high, excuse me, it was God using this to grow me for, and it was, it was to accomplish a, a temporary mission. But our obedience when it is in relation to God uh, is for the eternal mission. Today, we're going to do something a little different. We're going to do something a little different. We're not going to release the campus pastors to ask our transformation the moment. We're just going to do it here. So I want us to read this, honor everyone, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the emperor. And we want you to take a minute or two to wrestle with this question. Which of these do you struggle with? Which one of these four do you struggle with? And not just which one do you struggle with? I think out of that, the natural outcome of that question is, what are you going to do about it? Where is God convicting you that you have to change? I love you guys. Thank you. I hope you have a, a great day, a great week. And I'm going to release the pastors.